Our next presenter this morning is going to be Taylor Ucello from Stonehill College, Alpha Rho Chapter, and she will be presenting on the characterization of the amphibian CD4. Hey, hello, so my name is Taylor, and the project I've been working on for the past few years titled Characterization of Amphibian CD4. So first, an outline of what I'll be discussing today. I'm going to start off defining the immune system and talk about the differences between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. So I'll then go on to discuss the evolution of the immune system and focus specifically on the CD4 IL-16 interaction. I'll walk through the methods that we used and the results that we observed. So the immune system can be characterized into two distinct systems. You have your innate immunity, which is this first line um, response. The cells, the cellular components of the innate immune system are macrophages and natural killer cells neutrophils and granulocytes, and their role is to engulf and kill any foreign invaders or infected, or infected cells. So then you have your adaptive immunity, also known as the acquired immune system. It's acquired because it's built up over time and becomes more specific over time. The components of adaptive immunity are your B cells, which produce antibody, and your T cells, which can be either helper T cells to help these B cells produce antibody, your cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which again kill any infected cells. So the adaptive response is initiated by the cells of the innate immune system. So when foreign antigen is, enters the organism, these innate cells, also known as antigen-presented cells, so they can be your macrophages or your dendritic cells, will engulf the antigen and break it up by five organisms. The peptides will then be displayed on the surface of the antigen-presented cell in the context of major histocompatibility complexes, or MHC. So I mentioned before that are helper T cells and the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And one of the main differences between these T cells is the context in which they recognize this antigen. So your helper T cells recognize antigen presented in the context of MHC class 2. So when those macrophages or dendritic cells engulf any external pathogen, such as bacteria, it's broken down and presented on MHC class 2 to the helper T cell. Your cytotoxic T lymphocytes, on the other hand, recognize antigen in the context of MHC class 1. So this is any internal pathogen, such as a virus, that's engulfed by the antigen presented itself and presented on the surface. So that's uh, presented on the surface in MHC class 1. So what separates the helper T cells from the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and how they interact with these different MHC molecules is the presence of a co-receptor. So on your helper T cells, you have the CD4 co-receptor, which stabilizes the interaction between the MHC class 2 and the T cell receptor. On your um, cytotoxic lymph cytotoxic T lymphocytes, you have a CD8 co-receptor, and that's responsible again for stabilizing the interaction between MHC class 1 and the T cell receptor. So you'll notice that MHC class 2 has two chains, the alpha chain and the beta chain, and MHC class 1 is composed of the alpha subunit and the beta T material. So switching gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about the evolution of the immune system. So as I mentioned, innate immunity, this is your first line of defense, and it's a more primitive form of protection. So all organisms uh, dating back to early protists have some form of innate immunity. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, arose in parallel to the divergence between vertebrates and invertebrates. So you have your anate fins, or your jawless vertebrates, and your nathostomes, which are your jaw vertebrates. Anate and adaptive immunity relies on variable lymphocyte receptors, which are a little bit different, and I won't be much in those further today. Whereas your nathostome adaptive immunity is very similar to that of the mammalian adaptive immunity, and it relies on immunoglobin receptors. So the hallmarks of this adaptive adaptive immunity are the presence of these lymphocytes, which are your B cells and your T cells, um, antigen receptors, which can be the T cell receptors and the T cell receptors, and then the rearrangement genes that lead to this diversity on the B cell receptor and T cell receptor. And lastly, those genes of the MHC complex that I mentioned earlier. So focusing more specifically on the CD4 co-receptor. So CD4 is a 55 kilodalton monomer that's composed of four immunoglobin-like domains. So there's domain one and two connected by a hinge to domain three and four, where domain four is the most well-conserved. So as I mentioned earlier, the main role of the CD4 co-receptor is to stabilize this interaction between the MHC class two and the T cell receptor. Once this interaction is stabilized, it transduces signals to the cell that help to activate the T cell. But a more ancestral role for the CD4 co-receptor is potentially as an IL-16 receptor. So IL-16 is a chemokine that has a glycine-leucine glycine phenylalanine cleft, which like the D4 region of CD4, is, this cleft is also highly conserved. And CD4 is the only known receptor for this IL-16. So once you have this IL-16 CD4 interaction, it results in induced cell growth and migration, which is very important in the implant curves. <coughs> IL-16 
stain can be secreted by both the CD8 positive T cells and the CD4 positive T cells, but the pathways in which they are secreted vary slightly. CD8 positive T cells contain caspase 3, which cleaves that pro 16 into activated IL 16, which then can be released within four hours. CD4 positive T cells, on the other hand, do not have any of this, pro any of this caspase 3, so they rely on signaling through the T cell receptor to activate pro caspase 3 to be cleaved into caspase 3, which can then work to cleave the pro IL 16 into its active form. So, as I mentioned earlier, one of the functions of IL 16 binding to the CD4 receptor is an induction of cell growth. So how this works is the IL-16 protein binds and increases the amount of cytoplasmic calcium and an acetyl triphosphate and additionally translocates protein kinase C from the cytosol to the cell membrane. This causes the calcium channels to open, which allows an influx of calcium to the cell to de dephosphorylate the transcription factor NPAC. So now the activated NPAC can enter the nucleus and begin transcribing IL-2, which is a cytokine responsible for cell growth. So while this is happening, the interaction also causes the synthesis of the third gamma chain of the IL-2 receptor. So now the gamma chain can join the already present alpha and beta chain to form this trimer that has an even higher affinity for that IL-2. So the IL-2 that I mentioned being produced earlier acts in this autocrine manner to transition the T cells from the G0 resting phase to the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So the organism that we studied in our lab is then this lupus. Not only are they easy to breed and maintain in a lab, but they also, being an amniotic tetrapod, occupy this really key intermediate in the evolution from bony fish to mammals. And so since we're studying this ancestral role of CD4, it's important that we look to this early tetrapod. Additionally, they're the best studied non-mammalian vertebrates and have the best characterized immune system of any amphibian. So what we know is that mammalian immune systems have both these CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells, and the amphibian immune system closely resembles that of the mammalian. There's also evidence for these CD4 positive T cells in amphibians, but no one has been able to identify them in isolate them yet. So the goals of our lab are to understand this ancestral role of CD4 and perhaps the phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic role of CD4 as an IL-16 receptor. Then we hope to find CD4 T cells in amphibians and isolate them and study the interaction between IL-16 and CD4. Through this, we hope to gain insight into the amphibian immune system and in the future create a monoclonal antibody for CD4 so that in the future we can isolate and tie up these cells individually. So the way we study the existence of the CD4 co-receptor is through the properties of an IL-16 CD4 interaction. So the three major properties that we look at are upregulation of MHC class 2 on the surface of T cells, cell migration, and the inhibition of a mixed lymphocyte reaction. So first we looked at the sequence of IL the IL-16 protein in the variety of species. So in lab we use human recombinant IL-16. We also compared this sequence from Mus muscula's Xenopus tropicalis, which is a close relative of the Xenopus latus, and the bloodfish tachyphidu rubrics. So in green is conservation between all four of these species, yellow is conservation between three of the four, and blue and purple is conservation between two of the four species. So what you'll notice by, by looking at this is that the IL-16 sequence has been highly conserved in our history. So then we looked at the CD4 co-receptor. So the area highlighted in green is in the literature where IL-16 has been shown to bind to this CD4 co-receptor. We then looked at the, se the sequence in, again, the human mouse, mouse um, Xenopus latus, and Tachyphidu rubrics, and found, again, high conservation in the CD4 co-receptor. So in order to get our cells, we first have to euthanize an adult Xenopus latus, and we extract out the spleen. We then take the spleen and homogenize it to um, pull out cells from this organ. We separate the modified fold gradient, where the lymphocytes form this buffy, um, buffy coat region that's suspended in the fight cell, and the red blood cells sink to the bottom. We can then separate the cells based on the property of having the CD8 co receptor. So, as I mentioned, the lymphocytes who have either a CD8 co receptor or a CD4 co receptor. So, we incubate all the lymphocytes with AM22, which is an anti CD8 antibody. We then incubate the cells with anti mouse IgM conjugated to an iron bead, so we form this complex between the magnetic bead and the CD8 positive T cells. We pour the cells, cells through a magnetic column to separate out the cells that don't bind to the magnet as CD8 negative. We then remove the column from the magnet and plunge the remainder of the cells through it to collect as the CD8 positive cells. We're also able to do a similar experiment based on the property of having the CD4 co-receptor, because as I said, the only receptor for IL-16 is CD4. So again, we incubate the lymphocytes with biotinylated IL-16, and then again with an anti-biotin 
antibody conjugated to an iron bead to form this complex of the cells to see negative cells with the iron bead. Similarly, as before, we bore the cells through magnetic, uh, magnetic column to collect the CD8 negative or the IL6, IL6, the CD8 positive or IL16 negative cells, and then the CD8 negative IL16 positive cells. So our results from doing the separation with AM22, so based on the presence of CD8, we see an equal, a fairly equal amount of CD8 positive and CD8 negative T cells. And then by separating with IL-16, again, we see this equal concentration of cells that bound with IL-16 and cells that do not bind it. So then we look at gene expression for the CD8 co-receptor and the CD4 co-receptor. For all of our PCRs and all of our gels, we use beta-actin as our control because it's a housekeeping gene. So you'll notice in the first, well, the first lane is ladder, but in the, sec the next group of four lanes, that's expression beta-actin. It should be present in all of our cells. So first we incubate the cells with different varying concentrations of IL-16. So we have cells incubated at 0 molar, 10 to the minus 10 molar, 10 to the minus 9, and 10 to the minus 8 molars of IL-16. We then extract the RNA, convert it to cDNA, and amplify it to PCR, looking for expression of certain uh, genes. So the gene for CD4 and the gene for the CD8 receptor. So this first picture is showing the CD8 negative cell populations and looking for expression of CD4. So you'll notice, um, these strong bands right here represent the C gene expression for CD4 in the CD8 negative population. Whereas in the CD8 positive cell population, you don't see expression for CD4. Then looking at the beta chain of the CD8 uh, co-receptor, in the CD8 negative cell population, you see very faint gene expression. Whereas in the CD8 positive cell population, you see higher expression of CD8 beta. Likewise, for the expression of CD8 alpha, we see low expression for the CD8 negative cell population and much higher expression for the CD8 positive cell population. So next we looked at the upregulation of MHC class 2 because as I said earlier, one of the roles um, or one of the functional responses of IL-16 binding to CD4 is it causes this upregulation of MHC class 2 on the surface of the T cell. So this is where the increasing concentrations of IL-16 come into play. So what we hypothesized was that with more IL-16, you would have more upregulation of MHC on the surface of the CD8 negative T cells, but not on the surface of the CD8 positive. So this first gel you see is the CD8 negative cell population, and you do see this increase in MHC expression for MHC class 2 alpha. So as I mentioned, there's the alpha chain and the beta chain. Whereas in the CD8 positive cell populations, looking for MHC class 2 alpha expression, you see a fairly consistent level. Then looking at the MHC class 2 beta chain, again with CD8 negative um, cell populations, you see this increase in upregulation. Whereas for the CD8 positive cell population, you see a fairly consistent level of expression. So using image J analysis, we were able to plot this optical density or the brightness on the gels. So the CD8 negative cell populations, <coughs> you see this increase in optical density or gene expression. Whereas in the CD8 positive cell population, it's a fairly consistent level. And again, for this um, MHC class 2 beta chain, you see this steeper increase in the CD8 negative cell population than in the CD8 positive cell population. So next we looked at cell migration. So again, as I mentioned, one of the um, characteristics of IL-16 binding to CD4 is it causes the leukocytes to come to the area. So in this experiment, we injected two frogs in the peritoneal cavity one with diluted IL-16 and the other as our control with this amphibian phosphate buffer serum. 24 hours later, we extracted out the lymphocyte, or extracted out the cells from this area, and were able to visualize and, cal and calculate the percent that were granulocytes versus the percent that were lymphocytes. So in our control, we had about 80% granulocytes and 15% lymphocytes. Whereas in the IL-16, we had more like 70% um, granulocytes and 25% lymphocytes. So it's showing that the presently we injected with IL-16, more lymphocytes are stored in the area. So then we did some immunohistochemistry just to visualize the um, CD8 positive T cell population from the CD4 positive T cell population. So we incubated the lymphocytes with, again, this AM22 for the anti-CD8 antibody. 
And then with Rabidactin Ross IGM conjugated to a fit state on the green fluorescence. I'm looking at the wonder fluorescence microscopy, we saw a few green fluorescing cells. Then similarly, we incubated the cell population with biotinylated IL-16. Again, IL-16 would bind to the CD4. And then incubated the shift out of PE, which is the red fluorescence marker. We saw a few expression or a few fluorescing red cells. So then lastly, we looked at the mixed lymphocyte reaction, which I said was the third tier of this IL-16 CD4 interaction. So a mixed lymphocyte reaction is a T-cell independent mechanism that measures the proliferation of two T-cells on the surface. So the way that we can test this is through a BRDU ELISA. So BRDU is a thymidine analog that's incorporated into proliferated T-cells. But when IL-16 is incubated with the T-cells prior to mixing, the IL-16 forms this association with the CD4 receptor and prevents the MHC from interacting. So as I mentioned in the introduction, this interaction between MHC and the CD4 receptor is what signals the cell to become activated. So when IL-16 is taking the place, the T-cells are inhibited from responding. So to conclude, we've shown that we can separate cells based on the property of having the CD8 receptor, and also by their ability to bind IL-16. We've incubated cells with IL-16 and shown that they're upregulating MHC plus 2. We've injected cells or frogs with IL-16 and shown this in flux of lymphocytes to the area. In the preliminary work that we've done with immunohistochemistry, we hope to continue to quantify more cells that for us. So we hope to continue with our immunohistochemistry additionally this mix of the site reaction. We have not been able to successfully complete it yet, and then some close cytometry work that we have done in the past. So I'd like to thank my advisor, Professor Monero, um, Sigma Zeta, and Marion University for hosting, and Stonehill College for the grants that they provided. So, from looking at the sheer number of gels and different things, it seems like there's a phenomenal amount of work in this. How long has this been project? How long has this project been going on? And you're also using the expression "we." Which part specifically are you involved in? So, what I presented today has been the work that I have done for the past three years. And this project's been going on for at least five or six years. So, the two upper classes members and I first started the lab began with some of the gene expression, but the gels that I presented were the gels that I ran. And if you could summarize what your contribution to the project is in one sentence, you know, how, have you, how, is, it, how is it better for three years of you than it was when you started? I think probably the, most um, the biggest contribution I've had is this um, cell migration that I've presented on with IL-16 injecting into the peritoneal cavities. We haven't done that before I started in the lab. So you're using Xenopus. How much chytrid are you involved with? I'm sorry. The fungus chytrid? Oh, we haven't looked at that. You haven't? I just wondered if that was part of this. Oh, it would be interesting to look at that as well and see if that causes like, more T cells to, if we infect the cells with this fungus, to see if that increases the amount of T cells in the area. Yes? Can you, can you uh, go back to your initial um, slide talking about the comparison. So after you've done all your experiments, how would you say that Xenopus compares to mammalian vertebrates? So the Xenopus immune system, or amphibian immune systems in general are very similar to that of mammalian immune systems. Because as I said, they all <coughs> arose from this nathosome immunoglobin-based immune Correct, yes. So they are more similar to the nap system than they are to the 